All right, we've just got to Kobe here in Japan, and I'm delighted to be welcomed by Joel Stransky, who scoped out the city for me over the last couple of days. How are you getting on, Joel? Yeah, we're, uh, we're all getting on well, thank you, and uh, lovely to be here in Japan. It's been a cracking World Cup so far. The Japanese have been warm and welcoming, and as you pointed out, we're here in Kobe. We've had some good Kobe beef and a couple of good <laughs> meals and some good red wine. Just how good is the beef? Oh, it was sensational. And so, so we actually found uh, ourselves not in a normal... Um, you know, big expensive Kobe beef restaurant. We went with some of the um, Kabuka players, some of the South African guys, um, and some of the U.S. coaches, Gary Gold, and, and some of his team. We obviously and he spent time here. They took us to some little local place. We 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 bribed or barbecued our meat <laughs> ourselves outside on the pavement. It was sensational. Yeah, that's the way to do it here. Um, I was I was already very excited to chat to you anyway, but I was extra excited because this is where we're supposed to start our build-up to Ireland against South Africa in the World Cup quarter-final. All of a sudden, it looks like that's not going to happen. It, it, the whole dynamic changed yesterday, didn't it? Yeah. Although uh, there is a part of me that still thinks it will happen because I think um, Japan may well have played their, their final, their big mm. game, and... and, and, and uh, uh, from what I understood, they were targeting a big game against Scotland. Right now, that big ga game against Scotland is a massive game for them and an even bigger game for Scotland because if Scotland don't win, then Scotland are, are out. So, um, it's, uh, I, I mean, it's not unforeseeable that Scotland knocked Japan over an island still finish top of the group. Mm. What have you made of Ireland so far? Well, they were poor yesterday, weren't they? Yeah. And, uh, and, and there's a part of me that thinks that some of the changes that uh, were made to the team were maybe a little overconfident, you know, resting Johnny Sexton and maybe resting one or two other players, four changes after that big win against Scotland, um, maybe underestimating Japan a little bit, but uh, it'll come back to, to haunt the coaching staff, I think. But generally speaking, we also have to give credit where it's due. You know, Japan were outstanding. They, they shut the, the Irish attack down well. Ireland scored two tries from two cross kicks, you know, mm -hmm. and aside from that, they never really looked like penetrating that defensive line. So it was a great effort from Japan. Like, if you were in Johnny Sexton's shoes at the moment, would you be in a situation where you just want to play games? You'd rather kind of take the gamble and rather be tired going into a quarter final than be undercooked? I would, uh, I would want to be playing as, as much as possible, but and I certainly wouldn't want to be resting in the big games. Mm. Yeah. Because it's a tricky one, because he was saying in, in the warm-up games before the tournament that he perhaps could have played twice against Wales before the tournament started. He only got one run out. Like a, a player of his age, potentially, is there more of a risk of rustiness? Um, so I, I don't think it's got anything to do with age. I think it's, it's, there are players who need game time and there are players who, who, who love the rest. You know? And I think um, if I think back on, and I know he might not like me for saying this, John Smith, our former Springbok captain, was a player who who may have wanted rest, but I thought he, when he did rest, he came back and he, it took him a few weeks to get going again. You sure. know, there's some players who need the momentum and they need to carry that momentum forward. There are others who need the rest and who come back fitter, stronger, wiser after a couple of weeks of rest. I'm not sure where Johnny sits in, in that equation. What, what, what we do know, though, is that if you're playing big games, you want your big game players. What did he make of the Springboks? I guess, obviously, yesterday they were unbelievably impressive against Namibia, but more importantly against New Zealand. Talking to a few South African fans afterwards, they seemed pretty content with elements of the performance and that there were certain work-ons that that gap that emerged on the day could actually be closed within this tournament. Um, so I wasn't that impressed. Right. Uh, I, I was a bit disappointed, actually. And, and I'll say that for the simple reason that we kicked all the ball away. You know, and I think... We've worked pretty hard in the last year or so to be a bit better ball in hand, to be a little bit more patient. To, um, we've worked on our ball presentation skills, our lines of attack, our running. We've worked on every element of attack play, wanting to play an attack game. And I, and I understand the conditions are hot and humid and that it's sweaty out there and that the ball slips and doesn't always stick and that handling is difficult. But if you want to win big games, you've got to, you've got to go through big moments. You know? and, and I just think in the big moments, we kick the ball away. And... I, I saw some horrendous stats. I, th I think um, Faf de Klerk got the ball 70 odd times. Andre Pollard only got it 18 or 19, you know, and mm. that just shows you how much we kick from the base. It's, um, it, it was, from that perspective, for me, it was really poor. You know, if you want to beat New Zealand, you've got to be able to play ball in hand at the right time, granted. You don't want to be playing in these conditions, humid, hot, slippery, sweaty, you know, inside your own danger zone, but you can't be kicking the ball away on attack. And we, we kicked it away on attack. There were elements I, was, I thought were outstanding, the way we pressurized them into defense. 
we, um, we, you know, we, we chased them back, we put them under a lot of physical pressure, and to be fair, at times they handled it pretty well, but at times they didn't, you know, so, th so that side was, uh, was really good for me. The, the tries came from almost breakaway situations, maybe a tad fortuitous, but they had the skills to play in those humid, hot, slippery conditions when it really counted, and we never even tried, which was, mm. for me, a little disappointing. What represents a good tournament for South Africa this year? Winning. Winning. And oh, yeah. e everything else is a failure. Yeah, so I think there's an extent of failure. You know, I think I think um, the All Blacks are the best team in the world at the moment. I think it doesn't matter what the world rankings say. I think they're... Well, they're back at number one now. They, they, they would be back at number one now. And, but but, but it, it, the rankings count for nothing. And yeah. to be quite frank, the, the All Blacks are the team we like to judge ourselves against. They were really good against us the other day. I thought we, as I said, you know, we could have been a, a little bit better. Um, I, I, I look around the other teams, Ireland lost to Japan, um, Scotland have lost, France only narrowly beat Argentina, um, Wales have got a massive test uh, you know, against Australia, they've not exactly fired just yet, England have looked good at times, for, for me when I look at the performance of the other teams, I've absolutely no doubt South Africa are one of the top teams in the world and should be competing in the final. Um, we've played some outstanding rugby in the build-ups of this World Cup, we've looked solid, we won the rugby championship. I, I think we have to make the final, and, and I think if we make the final, we'll be in a good position to win it. So, if we said let's make the final, and if we lose the final, that's okay. Then we, we've become losers. Let's mm. be quite frank. You know, if we make the final, we must win the final. You, you mentioned Japan there, and we, we started by talking about them as well. I'd be interested to get your take on what that moment yesterday will do for Japan as a country, and especially the rugby supporters within a country, because being such a central part in 1995 of uh, a tournament that had such a, a central sporting role in a wider story in South Africa. Like, is there, is there a real thing that people in Japan can cling on to, especially the rugby supporters, in terms of the power that a result like that can bring, the power that a good run of the World Cup can bring? So I'll tell you what yesterday's result is going to do. It's going to pale that little Brighton miracle into a little bit of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ireland. <laughs> So I, th so I think South Africa learned about about this experience. You know, we got we got we got pipped at the post by Japan and Brighton four years ago. You know, and in, in a cracking game, and I was commentating on that game too. It was it was sensational, and it was sad as a South African, and I'm sure the Irish were devastated last night and and today, and and it has a it's a massive dent to their World Cup hopes. But but what it does do, it it shows you a real you know a little change in the balance of world rugby power. Mm. Japan have come to the fore, and granted they have quite a few foreigners who play on their team, who have nationalized, but it's a team they're unbelievably proud of, and you can see the groundswell, you know, coming in to support this team. The fans were sensational. I don't think it just happened yesterday, though. I think it's been a build-up, you know, for maybe six years, I sure. would guess, five or six years, since Eddie Jones became the head coach, since they knocked over the Springboks at the last World Cup. Um, in the build-up to, to this World Cup, they've, they've had, you know, a couple of good results. They've sh shown some good signs and they've got some good players, you know, and I think you underestimate them at your own peril. Does it add something, being the home nation? Does it give you that, an extra percentage? Absolutely, absolutely. It adds a bit of pressure, I think, as well, because, you know, you, don't, you can't escape the game and there's a bit more pressure when you're at home, but it's all inspiring. If you have a nation behind you and, and you can see those beautiful, and their shirt is a beautiful shirt, and mm. you see their beautiful shirt being worn in the streets, in the stadiums, in the bars, everywhere you go, the fan parks, it must be inspiring. And, and I think to see the TV coverage they're getting and the media exposure, um, the supporter base growing, it has to be all inspiring. Does, do you kind of yearn for the days of 24 years ago when you look around at the moment that Japan had yesterday? Of course, it's on a very different scale. They're not going to, to win the World Cup unless it really is a humongous miracle. It, it was kind of a, a similar feeling for you, I'd imagine, this great moment, obviously winning the Webb Ellis Trophy, but in front of your own fans. Yeah, very much so. And, and I think for us, it, it started in similar fashion. We got off to a good start against Australia, you know, and I think that was maybe when we laid down the marker and we set our standards. And, and from there, we, 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 we stumbled and started a little bit, but then we improved, we got better, and we won the final. And, and, and it is inspiring. I mean, do I long for, to be playing the game now? No, I mean, I'm quite content where, where I am in life. Um, but is it wonderful to watch and to see? It is, you know, and that's why we, we love Rugby World Cup so much, because... We do see the upsets. We do see Uruguay knock over Fiji. And we do see Japan beat South Africa four years ago and now beat Ireland. 
we, 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 see, we saw the French, you know, come from behind and pip Argentina in a nail biter. And, and, and I think that's what World Cups are all about. The Springboks and the All Blacks going to battle in a, in a pool game, you know, Australia and, and, and uh, Wales smashing each other in a pool game with everything at stake. It, it is sensational. It sure is. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is um, sports psychology, because it's very easy when you, if, say, for example, we saw somebody do what you did in, in a World Cup final and take the burden all on their shoulders, kick all the points and win a World Cup, you could delve into the development in sports science over the past uh, couple of years, past couple of decades, really, and say that this is why that person had the mental strength. Was that something you tapped into at all uh, almost 25 years ago at this point? So, so, so actually, I think in 1995, we didn't really work with a sports mm. psychologist, but in, in the build-up to that, in, uh, for, for one or two of the other teams I played with, we did, you know, and, and I think it does help. I think it does create a, an understanding and an awareness of, of one's role in a team environment more so than anything else. And if you kick the, the points and you take that responsibility, it is no more than performing your role in a team environment. But it is about understanding that what the role is, understanding the dynamics of team, um, getting everyone to work together with a common goal, and I, th I think when you, when you have all those psychological issues better down, it, it does come together. But on on a personal note, I think, and I think Johnny Sexton would be the same. Johnny Wilkinson in his time, Dan Carter, um, Bowden Barrett, Andre Pollard, all the, the the kickers here at the Rugby World Cup. I, I, I think kicking those goals and and taking the responsibility is what they do on a daily basis, and and it's not something they're unaccustomed to. It's um, it's it's an it's an ability to shut out the pressure and deal with it, put it aside, and 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 perform your role. And it is, it's it's our role in the team. That's what we do. Yeah. Did you find that there was an added pressure given the not only the, the home Rugby World Cup but also everything else that went around it, the symbolism politically that 1995 Rugby World Cup played? So so there was a little bit of pressure, and, and only because there were little things like we had to learn the new national anthem. Mm. We we did a bit of coaching in some of the townships. We um, we had a, a team little slogan, one team, one country, that we had to live, eat, sleep, and dream. You know, it was, it was about helping, you know, you know, a, a nation unite around a sports team. And, and to be fair to, to us, though, we, we were just pawns in the whole thing. We, we, we were just the players who wanted to go out there and get between the four lines and do our bit. It was Nelson Mandela who drove the process off the field. It was the management of South African rugby who, you know, put in place and enabled that process to grow within the team and. You know where the team became little, little bits of the process, but for us, to be to be brutally honest, I mean, I, and I look back in retrospect a lot, and we think about it a lot. At the time, we we never had any idea of the of the significance of of what we were doing. We were just playing a rugby world cup, and we desperately wanted to win it on home soil. What was happening happening around us was um, was unbelievable, and we could see it happening, and we could see the signs of a country coming together, a nation coming together around a sports team. But that wasn't driven by us. That was driven by Nelson Mandela, the great Nelson Mandela. It was driven to some extent by, by SA Rugby, Edward Griffiths, Mornay Duplessis, you know, the management team, Hitch Christie. We, we, we just wanted to go out and play the game we loved. When did you realize that it did have that greater significance? So I think in the build-up to the final, or the week of the final, we saw, um, well, we'd had, we, we'd had Madiba come and spend time with us before the opening game. But in the build-up to the, to the final, we saw this real groundswell. We saw, you know, the, the taxis in South Africa with Springbok flags, not just, you know, the new South African flag, with Springbok flags hanging out their window. We saw, we saw the kids on the streets shouting some of the Springbok names. Granted, it was mainly Chester Williams, but it, it was shouting some of the Springbok names. Um, it, was, it was the supporter base growing. You know, the, 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 the Springbok green jersey became more and more evident and apparent. So there was this definite groundswell the week of the final, but but only really after the final did we probably realise the significance of of how this nation came together, how proud all South Africans stood there for a little while supporting a, a rugby team. Was it easy? This might maybe uh, a stupid question, but was it ever easier for you to kind of understand the importance of that, given your Jewish background at all? Yeah, you know, it's probably a step too far. I think. Um, you, you, so, so I, I say I say it's a step too far. In fact, it's definitely a step too far. You know, we we were young, privileged white South Africans mm. who grew up in a privileged a privileged household, in a privileged school, in a priv privileged environment, and we were very much protected from from any other part of the South African dramas by our environment. You know, and <clears throat> whether you were Jewish or Christian or whatever religion you were, 
it, it made no it, it was made almost no no difference difference to our political situation because we were part of um, the elite. We were part of uh, you know a, a, a population that that could, you know had benefits and yeah. and 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 I think as as and having said that, we came from a very liberal background. I came from a very English and very liberal background. We were, you know, very pro-change and anti-apartheid. Um, but having said all that, we still lived in an environment which was a little, you know, a little better off. And so when it came to to rugby and playing the game, actually nothing really counted. We just wanted to get between the lines. We just wanted to do the best we could possibly do and play the game we loved. I guess, yeah, the, the question really is, was, was being a representation of the Jewish community as big a thing in South Africa uh, at the time? Your answer obviously is no, that it was actually being uh, a, a white person really was all that mattered in South Africa at that moment. Yeah, I think so. You know, no, and obviously the Jewish community is in, 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 around the whole world is quite a tight-knit community mm -hmm. and, and, and obviously I, I, would, I got a lot more support from the Jewish community and... Uh, but again, it was a privileged support base to start with, you know. So I, I, I don't, it, it didn't really make a difference in our team environment, in the way we played the game, and how we went about things. What the difference for us was really white privilege. Do you see many of the '95 team often? Do you meet up often? Yeah, we had lunch uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, and um, sadly, we've had we've had a few horrible occasions to meet in the last two months with James Moore passing and then Chester Williams passing. So. It was. It's, it certainly wasn't um, happy occasions, but but a couple of weeks before James passed, we actually uh, we, we had a, a little bit of a lunch and a few drinks, and in fact we tried to combine it with the 2007 Rugby World Cup squad as well, the, the two winning squads, and and we had you know the two squads coming together. It mm -hmm. was quite entertaining and lots of fun. <laughs> It's funny you say that, actually, because on our show a couple of weeks ago, Marcus Horan was talking about how after the passing of Anthony Foley, all the Munster players suddenly became far more of a tight-knit community. They did the classic male thing where they didn't speak about their feelings before that. They didn't really meet up before that. They started to drift. And then it took that horrible moment for them to come together. And I guess, unfortunately, you've had to experience quite a few of them. And perhaps the unintended consequence of all of that is that you do become more of a tight-knit community. Yeah, so so we have experienced a few. I mean, from uh, the first person, the first one to pass was Ruben Kruger, then obviously Jos van der Vestes, and then now James and Chesi. Um, and I think the, I think these things, you know, they do make you a little bit closer. But I mean, I suppose from the, the downside living in South Africa is that we are quite spread out. Cape Town, Durban, Joburg, Bloemfontein, all over the show. It's quite difficult to get together. It's not it's not easy. It's not one small community where you can you know drive for an hour and we can all meet up. Um, but we do try to gather, and, and, and I, think, I think what happens maybe when something like one of your mates passing happens, it's not so much about gathering the troops, it's about appreciating life a little sure. bit more, you know, so that's maybe makes you be a little bit more introspective and, you know, look at family time and a, a little bit differently and, and uh, you know, make sure you put time aside and make sure it's quality time. And, 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 and then with that collective group of mates, you know, I don't think we're ever going to be the group of guys that talk about our feelings and come out, but, but certainly we are a group of guys that when we get together, we'll enjoy each other's company. When you say you're introspective in those moments, obviously the very sad passing of Chester Williams recently, what is that introspection? What, what is the, the internal monologue when you take a bit of time to reflect on, on what that means for your own life? So I think as South Africans, we live, um, we live in a completely different environment. You know, we had a, an attempted burglary at a house yesterday while, while we are here in Japan, and and, and I think um, whether it's a mate passing from a heart attack like Chesey or James, or whether it's someone you know who experiences massive drama in a, in a, in crime, in a crime-related incident, I think what you have to do is you have to, you have to take stock sometimes. You mm. have to you know, have a little look around and understand what life is all about and you know, live life for today. Make sure you, you actually spend time with the ones you love and tell them you love them. And, and ensure that one day, if it does happen to you, you know, heaven forbid it does, that that you know, you, when it, if and when it does happen, you know, you, you you're at peace, I, I suppose, with the people around you and with those you love. Yeah, that there is a, a greater picture here that ultimately sometimes sport can be trivialised, but it does play yeah. this very important role at the same time that does enrich people's lives. Well, it, it I think it's uh, it's a great enabler to bring people together mm -hmm. to to. Um, 
to enrich each other's lives, to do good, to uh, create a foundation of good, charities. I mean, I have a charity that's built on a sporting foundation. Um, so, so sport is this wonderful conduit that, that does so much more than just sport itself. And, and I think um, most importantly, it probably teaches us great values. And, and rugby in particular teaches us incredible values, teamwork, dedication, hard work, you know, um, integrity, honesty, all those, all those things that we, we, we live by outside of rugby as well. And, you know, we have these moments where we probably need to reflect to make sure that our foundation is still solid. Yeah, it's very true. Joel, it's been fantastic chatting to you. It's been uh, great catching up. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, just before we wrap up, I should probably ask you, who do you think is going to win the World Cup? Well, I'm first, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great chatting. It's, and, 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 and thanks very much for the invite to come and have a chat too. As to who's going to win it, as South Africans, we very, um, you know, we always find that silver lining. We've come to realize now that if the All Blacks want, have to, are going to win the World Cup, they've got to beat us twice. We only have to beat them once. <laughs> so we're, we're hopeful that uh, we're, we're hopeful that we'll have an easier quarterfinal now that Ireland are under a little bit of pressure and that uh, we'll get through to the final and that we'll beat the All Blacks in the final.